it's it's a very accessible festival. But it's still out of Sydney. Yeah, but I think regionally people are hungry for access to this sort of uh, event. Because apart from anything else, I mean, it's something for the region, yes, but it's also something for filmmakers. So all the filmmakers come yes. here and they're out of town. Welcome everybody, I'm so excited. This is the official opening of the second Dungog Film Festival. And I'm um, having trouble containing my excitement about having you all here. I can't believe the cinema is full. And this is um, a historical moment actually. Um, we just restored the stage with um, the help of Borrell and have put the screen, this is a new screen, it's back in its original position where it was in 1973. So this is the first time the lights are flickering on this screen like they did 35 years ago. Someone once said that uh, a community is a, a group of people who sit by a fire telling each other stories. And I think that uh, what Alana and all the crew at the Dun Dungog Film Festival have managed to achieve, not only last year but now this year and into the future, is to get a very interesting community of people to sit round a very large fire telling very expensive stories. <laughs> and I think that's a great, great tribute to Alana, Stavros, the whole team here at the Dungog Film Festival. It's a great tribute to New South Wales Mining to show the initiative and the creativity, Nikki Williams to, to come to the support of what is a great, great regional important initiative um, in Australia. On, so on, on behalf of the filmmakers, I'd be presumptuous, but I, I really want to thank you all for um, having the wherewithal and the, the guts and the uh, creativity to get such a great festival together. Um, I'm here on behalf of Unfinished Sky. I'd also like to let you know that uh, our producer, Kathy, one of our producer, Kathy Overett, and one of our stars, Roy Billing, is in the audience, so you can equally harass them after the movie, as you may choose to harass me. Uh, but I do, anyway, I just really want to thank uh, everyone here most importantly of all, in the brief time of I've been here, I'd, I'd really like to say that the enthusiasm on the faces of the people of Dungog has been really profound and uh, so welcoming. So I'd like to really thank you guys for opening your town to um, a group of reprobates, uh, self-indulgent, some middle class, bourgeois, <laughs> idle, uh, self-important, uh, yeah, I could go on for hours in that vein. But thank you very much. Thank you very much for having us. Um, I'd just like to um, reiterate the great mantra that has become this festival, and I'd like you to repeat it after me. Done Sundance. Done Sundance. Come on, loud, you can do better. Done Sundance. Done Sundance. Done Can. Done Can. Done Gog. Duncan done speaking. I hope you enjoy the film. Boots fit right then, do they?
Where are you from? Afghanistan. Oh, Jesus. Hey, you're in the Lego, aren't you? You Muslim? Muslim, Islam, Taliban. No, no, I'm a Talibanist. 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 You're a communist? Communist. Oh, great. That makes it all a lot better, doesn't it? A communist. choice for opening night? Ah, oh, beautiful. So you came all the way from Newcastle just for the opening night? Yeah. Why did you do that? Um, just because we've always been to short films and yeah. I just loved Australian films. I only watch Australian films. Uh, it was really exciting seeing it here last night, Andrew, in this audience. Um, not just because it was special in a, in a different regional place. We've screened in, you know, Alice Springs, Mackay, wherever. But it was, um, it felt like a real community, a film community as well as the community of Dungog here last night. And it was um, a lot of warmth and a lot of goodwill. And, you know, sometimes at film festivals, you know, the knives are out. And I, you know, maybe they are. Maybe there are a few in my back that I don't know about yet. But uh, no, it was, a, it, was a, it was a great vibe about being here. Tell us about the making of the film briefly, about the, the we, you know, the original material is uh, Dutch, I think, a Dutch screenplay. Yeah, the, the Unfinished Sky is adapted from a Dutch screenplay called The Polish Bride, which was then made into a film about 11 years ago. It was a very successful Dutch film. A Dutch company wanted to start making English language films and they thought this was a good place to start. They found co-production partners in Australia and they formed a company called New Holland Productions and, you know, then I became involved. So. And when you got involved, it was because you liked the script? I liked the script. I liked where it could go. I mean, I, I guess there was a big difference between what was going on in Europe in the early 90s, which is what the Polish Bride's about, and what was going on in Australia in the early sort of noughties, in the post 9-11 world. And, you know, once I found a way into it, I, 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 you know, I really fell in love with the possibilities. Because it's layered, it's complex, it's touching a lot of issues, but ultimately it's still a love story. Yeah, well, I mean, I think at the heart of most films, not every film, but certainly something like this, if you can have drama, you, the, the relationships are what, what are key. And yeah. once we got the, that to work, then we could work out the balance of the, you know, the low-level politics and medium-level suspense yeah. and violence yeah. involved. Yeah, because it does it changes. Casting briefly. How did you cast uh, the, the two leads? Um, well, William sort of cast himself, just in, in look, in, in you know, he's a great actor, he's a great mind. Um, but you know, he just looks so perfect as the, you know the strong, but possibly beaten Aussie farmer. And uh, Monique Hendricks very interestingly played the lead role in the Polish Bride. As a Polish. As a Polish. She's a Dutch woman playing a Polish no, a woman. Now she's a Dutch woman playing an <laughs> Afghani woman. I was quite, I was slightly cynical when the producer said, can you consider Monique? And I, as a courtesy to them, I said, yeah, I'll go and see her. So we had a meeting in Amsterdam. And uh, she was just so great. And she's, she's that dark beauty is Amazonian. And I just thought the, there's a real match between the physical strengths between Monique and William. And, uh, and she's so lovely and so talented as well. And she actually learned Afghani for the role. She learned... Dari, uh, <laughs> learnt the lines. Lines, yeah. yeah. Just very convincingly. Oh, look, I mean, the, the, the great shame for Monique is that this is her first English language film. <laughs> And she speaks Dari for most of it. And out of Toronto, she got three offers from American movies. All were playing Middle Eastern women. And it's like, because it's such sod's law in this business, isn't it? That's right. All right, first of all, the first and most important question I have for you is Kim's Handmade Choc Tops. Yep, yep. <laughs> How did that come about? Before we get into the story of the theatre. Well, um, I didn't realise that Choc Tops were made locally. Yeah, you know, I just thought they were frozen and you know, get delivered. And um, so anyway, when we took over, Kim started making the Choc Tops. And then we thought that was normal with everyone. And then um, 
you know, when we saw, went to meet other people in other cinemas and stuff, we realised that they were all getting frozen ones from China. You know, so we just thought, well, we'll push the fact that we're making them here. You know? <laughs> That's very good. Have you done a taste test? Yeah, <laughs> taste test. They taste really nice. They're better than the other ones. <laughs> better yeah. than the Chinese. Okay, you, as you said, when you took over, which wasn't that long ago, this is no. the second Dungog, f f Dungog Film Festival, the first festival. The original, not the original owner, but uh, yeah, Ken. Ken was the was the operator here, yep. um, and he's still around, of course. Tell us about how you came into it. Um, it was really through Luke. He pestered us for about 12 months, wanted to go down and help help at the local cinema because there was another boy down there doing the job. Right. And we just kept putting him off and saying, "No, look, there's someone already there doing it." That sort of stuff. Um, and just one day we gave in and said, yeah, okay, we'll go down and, and Kim brought him down and met Ken and yeah, Ken was love to have him around and start helping out. And uh, I noticed the real change in, in his attitude to life and stuff, it really brought him out yeah. and it was really doing a lot of good for him yeah. to meet people and that sort of thing. Uh, and then it wasn't long after that that Ken was retiring and you know, just about devastated Luke and you know, he was wanting us to buy it and whatever. And we said, you know, don't worry that someone will take it over and um, they'll want help. Yeah. And then when it didn't look like anyone was going to step forward, I sort of thought, you know, it'd be great in 10 years' time if you semi-retire or something. Yeah. Uh, I thought, oh, well, you look at the books and it was paying for itself, you know, so we thought, well, we'll give it a go and, you know. The mining industry in New South Wales made a, a very clear decision that it wanted to make, as an industry, major investments in the social infrastructure of the communities in which we operate. What better than the Dungog Film Festival, set here in this incredible town, right in the middle of the Hunter Valley. Uh, and this festival uh, is important for several reasons. Obviously, it, it redresses the cultural imbalance uh, between you know, the cities and, and regional Australia, and that's, that's very, very important. Secondly, it's bringing creative people into this town, but it's also potentially inspiring young people who live not only in Dungog, but in the surrounding regions. Uh, you know, maybe there's a, a, a different way that they could look at the world. Maybe there's a future for them in, in film. So that, that inspirational innovation piece is, is very consistent with what we wanted to achieve. And thirdly, of course, a festival of this size with the potential to, to become an international lifestyle and cultural event is bringing a, an enormous amount of business to Dungog and to the surrounding region. So a diverse economy is something that the industry um, believes is important to support. That's about, that's sustainability. But of course for you there was also this other issue that by supporting it you're doing something else, enriching the, the, the social environment. And that, that's that's incredibly important. I mean, you know, the mining industry, the companies that have been operating in this country for a couple of hundred years, and they're major investors in, in their local communities. But it's only when you get together as an industry that you can help um, something big, something where, where the idea is big, you can help it to grow. And that's what Dungog represents. Uh, and it, it's a social investment. It's not a, it's not a dollar investment, yes, it's yes. a social investment. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's an intangible thing, but it's very, very important. As well as actually supporting the festival and supporting Alana and Stavros, who I really admire for getting it going. Um, there's also a lot of films that the FTOs supported financially here and it's a chance to actually see them on a big screen in pretty unusual surroundings. So and is the, is the rationale for supporting it because it's a regional event? That helps, yeah. um, but it's also just that anything that gets people watching films, anything that gets people out there talking about them, engaging with them, thinking about them, is good for us. Our idea of a film festival was maybe half a dozen films over two days at the theatre, maybe some old ones. Uh, last year is the first one, three months to organise it. She blew us away with, with what was done and then this year's grown another three times. So, you know, who knows, who knows what we can really do with it. What was the objective from the council's point of view to bring people to Dungog? Was that as simple as that? It really was as simple as that. Let's create a small community festival that will attract people here for a weekend, fill the rooms up, all that sort of of stuff and uh, it's been turned into a, a fantastic monster. <laughs> I think the impact that it's had on this town has been incredible. All the local business houses, all the locals are so um, pleased. Um, everybody's, you know, working together to make sure that this all, this festival happens and um, the economy will, you know, this weekend will certainly get a lot out of 
the film festival. Yes. I would th I would think over this weekend the festival would draw probably around 3,000 people. That's that's big numbers. That is a, huge numbers. <laughs> it is huge numbers. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of. Um, buses being transported in tomorrow. Are you aware of any return visits, people who come oh, to yes, the festival? Oh yes, definitely. Yeah? Yes, yes, definitely. It has been a huge <laughs> challenge, believe me, it's been a huge challenge. But so people are we, staying in private homes? We, we, this is the first year that we've um, home billeted and that has taken off really, really well. Um, and I'm really pleased that you know the community opened their hearts to um, let me fill their beds. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, here's the rest. Thanks. You're distracting the female staff, eh? Oh, afternoon, Mr. Ross. How was your weekend? That was all right. There's a change as the clients want. Just get back to me by the end of the day. What have you been doing? Just nursing a hangover, mate. Ready for lunch? Ready when you are, big fella. Right. So how's Anthea? Oh, she's all right. She's a bit upset. Did you root her? Tyson. So who rooted her then? No one. No one rooted her? No, she's upset all the friends are leaving Brisbane. So why don't you root her? OK, I admit that she's good looking and that male-female friendships are semi-artificial because they've got this little unresolved sexual tension thing. But if anything would happen between us, it'd stuff the friendship. To risk that, I have to be certain that things would work and they wouldn't. I mean, how many blokes has Anthea had that she still gets along with? You two are good mates. Once. <laughs> but, like you say, our relationship was semi-artificial anyway. Besides, all Anthea and I ever talk about is our love life. If we ever got together, we'd have nothing to talk about. So, in the, in the meantime, I've got, I've, got a, I've got a friendship. I've got a great friendship. Okay, I admit that I enjoy the unresolved sexual tension thing. Love that unresolved sexual tension thing. Incoming. <clears throat> yeah, so last night I um, cooked dinner for my baby nephew right after I fixed the car. Give you chicks. So alternative. Tantric. Ricky. My, my film, uh, called All My Friends Are Leaving Brisbane, it's, a, um, it's one of this new generation of people doing it yourself um, that seems to be happening, um, where my husband wrote it as a screenplay, which it got him into film school at Afters, and that's where I met him and fell in love with him. And I saw the play, um, a play version being put on in Brisbane, and, um, and I thought that'd be a great little indie film. And it was on a shelf for a while, and then at a party one day I said, we're going to make a film in 2005. And so I went home and said, well, let's do it then. <laughs> so we decided, how much money are we prepared to lose and never see again? So we decided $20,000. So we put together a great um, green light for a video feature and we sent the script around to a lot of really great actors and we got all of our first choices and then um, Judd Overton came on board as a DOP and, um, and about a month out we worked out that we'd had enough encouragement from people and um, including places like Kodak and, um, and um, a lot of equipment houses were very enthusiastic and we decided that we realised we could um, if we doubled our budget shoot on film and so we sort of bit our fingernails off and um, and my parents helped and we shot for forty two thousand dollars and we came to a symbol cut and at that point we applied to the AFC and we got post-production funding so we were able to reshoot some stuff that didn't look very good <laughs> and, um, and then we got some um, and we did a really great post-production process a great um, soundtrack of indie bands from Brisbane and so everybody was inspired by the script basically yeah it yeah. was it was the script is is a, a lovely a lovely 
sweet story, like romance. <laughs> What's that? What? I don't know. It's a fucking croc. What? There's a croc in here. Get up the tree. Please, please. Get up the tree. I'll get please. it. Please. Grace, it's please. Grace, it's water. Just get up the tree. Okay. 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 Song that kids sing. It's a three, three cheeky monkeys sitting in a tree, teasing Mr. Crocodile. Can't catch me. Along comes Mr. Crocodile. Quiet as can be. Snap. Thank you, Adam. Tell us a little bit about the making of the film, the origins and how you sure. shot it. Um, it's based on a true story, which was um, these three guys were up in the north of um, Australia and they were uh, cleaning their quad bikes. One, one, one of them went into a river and this crocodile unfortunately went and got the guy and their two, his two mates were stuck up a tree and the crocodile came back and harassed them and showed the dead body and all sorts of stuff. How did you hear about that story? Um, I actually got it off the internet. I, had, I sort of knew about it, and, but um, I started doing a lot of research on the net and that was one of the most significant stories that came up and um, yeah, that's how I sort of found out about it. But um, that sort of sparked off the whole thinking. A committee of global experts was appointed to work out what keeps going wrong. Yeah, I'm a political cartoonist, been doing it for years and years, and um, you do events, you do political, international, terrible events. Time and at great expense, the complete spectrum of humanity was represented. So the whole idea of, of global events seem like they're disjointed and have no, like fate just dis determines things, and um, if that's... And this film was an attempt to try and get some coherence between uh, events, why things happen, is there any sort of basic sort of thing we're doing that causes uh, tensions in um, the state we're in, which is pretty, pretty hairy. Some of the committee are caricatures, as it was felt real people tend to take human failure personally. It's cheaper for me to draw, you know, uh, a Russian and an Irishman and a Scotsman than to find a character and make of acts and pay for them and direct them. So I, I had that margin when I drew figures that sit in with the real figures. I could give them lines that fitted what uh, the interview said yes. and the archival suggestions. So we kept changing this thing right through the film. Their brief was to workshop the past. Look out for high-level madness and interview anyone who might have given some thought to Global Haywire. Ah, Farimachi, what do you do? Ah, Shir Bachiya, Shabas Bachiya, Shabas Nyaza.
ما ویل چې ته بنه شي کولی خو واقعی چې ته پوی شوی دی شیر بچی ای سلا مخا مخو گوره نخدی دو سیویش تره چه نخدی دنیا دی دی نخی ختم کلو پلارا ما تا ترم ویلیو چه چه دنیا ته چه این کار که پیلا دا سوچ که چه دا دنیا خیده پر دا که بدی دا تا هر وقتی ما تره تره خبری کهی تره بدی اخپل کار کهی تا با ما سره کار کهی زنا ورم دی تره خبری دی ماں بندی ترہ گراند ہے تو بھی لینا پوئے گی تو بالکل سوچ دی مختلف دا ماں بندی ماں بندی ترہ گراند ہے ماں سوچ بیل دا تا سوچ بیل دا تا تا خسرہ ہم دا شو نہ خلے گی ہر وقت ماں تیس ہے ترہ خبر مکہ و ترہ خبر مکہ و ماں تیس ترہ خبر خیلے گی ماں تے سبق خلے گی دات سے شدی دار منی نہ خلے گی When I was uh, inspired to make this film in response to the rising uh, you know stigmas that um, were becoming attached to being an Islamic person a person of the, of the Islamic faith after 9-11 and I had a lot of experience travelling in that area in the tribal areas and around the Middle East and it didn't match my experience with those people. So you wanted to show the people that you saw? Exactly yeah. and in fact you know when you do meet those people and you spend time with them you realize that they're actually not too unlike ourselves and I've just been speaking to some residents, local residents of Dungog and they saw a bit of themselves in the small town lifestyle of the people in the tribal areas of Pakistan. The, the, the making process was, was you know, a, a, a big story in itself, you know, we had to go in there in secret, I was bearded, I wore a turban, contact lenses, the local shawa kameez, I had to, you know, look like them to blend in because I had no permit to be in there. People aren't getting permits to be in there. So it was also dangerous for you personally? It was. It uh, was. You, must, you must feel very committed to this story and this cause. You know, the, f the, the more challenging it became, it was very strange. I, I became even more passionate and even more determined to uh, move ahead. The more barriers that I came up against just made me more passionate to, to get through them. And when the opportunity came up to uh, show this film this morning here it's at, and in a private uh, invitation-only screening, what was your response? I mean, obviously you said yes, but what was, how did you feel about that invitation? Oh, I felt honoured. I felt honoured to be able to uh, come up to Dungog and show it in a different environment to people living in the country. And I really wanted to be here so that I could see what their reaction was going to be. What's that smell? Hey, you've been smoking that shit again? You were warned yesterday. The new bloke turns up to smell that shit. We're all fucked. Get him, boys. Get him. Don't let him out. Get him! You think it's a joke, guys? You're a selfish little girl, Simone. Put him in the vice, on the bench. I've worked all my fucking life for this, but I'm gonna fuck it up. You were warned yesterday, weren't you? Yeah, and you you understood. You know what I'm gonna chop off. You do, don't you? Here it comes, here it comes. You little prick! I'm serious, it's gonna happen, boy. That's enough, Jack. No, it's not enough, Wesley. We got two weeks to go, and this little feral bitch is gonna fuck it up for all of us, right? She knows the new bloke's a spy, and he could walk in here at any... <laughs> all right, all right, sweet cheeks, that's your fun for today. All right, Andre, here you go. Can't spend all day using you. Now, did you like that one? Is that a good one? Oh, yeah, there you go. There you go. Having a bit of fun, are we? <laughs> Who's Jack? I am, boy. I believe you used to be the foreman. I'm Dave.
the conception of it, the idea I got from watching A Current Affair one night about some out of work waterboard guys in Melbourne um, just sitting there playing cards doing nothing. They've been doing it for six months and uh, uh, the community got hold of it and thought what a waste of money. I thought, I thought well that's um, that'd be make a, a great low budget film, something like that. And the next day, coincidentally enough, I heard about a workshop shooting somewhere in America and I went hang on and that's how the idea was conceived. And yep. developed it through various drafts? Oh yeah, yeah, God, I, 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 I've done about, it's really funny because what was on the film, what the people saw at the film at, at, at the premiere, was nearly the first draft. I actually went everywhere with it for 10 drafts and went straight back to the first draft and just polished it and that's what it is now. It's been a whole journey and back again. That's a, sort of a process of elimination. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I find myself going to all the characters' houses and meeting their families. I'm going, this is unnecessary. <laughs> all the action's in the workshop. Yes. Get back there. And that's where the opening draft was, all in the workshop. Yeah. So I've just gone back there with a, with a bit of a polish. And casting? Casting, well, you know, Drew, because I've had the script so long, um, um, I've had various producers, like John Brozak, who's a fantastic guy, but he got lured away by Wogboy. Um, I've had Tony Buckley, who, um, as you know, he's had a bit of health problems and had to drop 80% of his projects and mine was one of them. So through that long 10 year process of all the producers I've had, it's reached various actors. And Colin Frills, it reached him five years ago and he loved it. And he was just saying, when's this getting up? And of course, it was back in my drawer. David Field, I actually wrote David for him 11 years ago. I saw him in a short film, Gregor, short, Gregor Jordan's short film called Stitched. And I just saw this rough face with this emotional journey in that. And I thought, hey, that's David. So that's why I named him David, <laughs> just to keep, keep, keep my mind on. And, and, and those two guys were my pri primary targets. And of course, they came on board when it was necessary. And that's how the cast happened. And the other guys, um, Simon Van and 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 uh, Michael Danker and you know they're they're NIDA graduates and they're all fantastically talented you know as Brendan Clark and all the other guys and Andrew Windsor one of the producers he's a fantastic actor too so so and Martin Dinglewall he was brilliant in the film I mean so everyone's just done their job making the film is about as close to um, boot camp as, as really you'll get because we had the production in any factory you'll find that they have a a clerical office upstairs and the floor downstairs. Um, so our clerical office, of course it was an abandoned shell, that's what we had to find to c rebuild it. Um, so we had our production office upstairs and we had our um, our main main um, home downstairs, our key set. And uh, we shot three six day weeks, which is more intimate than anyone wants to do because that six that seventh day Sunday doesn't register. If you don't have more than one stretch of day off, it's not really a day. You're and you and, you, and it's an intense film, isn't it? Oh, it's the, the, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, there, there's nothing casual about it, and um, yeah, you know, the by the second week, the agitation for all the survival reasons became very tangible and very real. But Wait, everyone did that just, help? Oh, it it took shape in all the right ways. And mm. Colin coming on on set, you know, yeah, yeah. Colin had his own sort of like <clears throat> stuff going on, and he got there, and he just sort of like in, in a way you'd, you'd watch. And I mean, the guys, Colin Friels, so you'd watch him sort of build it on the day, and the camera would sort of swim around and catch him building Jack. Um, that, that's how you got. I mean, you, regardless of his levels of rehearsals, he's what he is anyway. But his method, at least from what I witnessed firsthand, was um, was remarkable. Everyone sort of stepped back a bit and just watched him find it. Yeah. And David Field? Ah, uh, well, David. They seem actually to have two very different approaches to the craft. And as much as David's a, a, a deep researcher, it seems to me he turned up and put the shirt on and the body would adjust and a, a tone would adjust and you could sort of almost snap out of that um, in between takes if you needed to. That's how shaped he is. Yeah, they had very, you know, the two such yeah. actors you sit back and admire so profoundly. It's very kind of you they, to talk about your fellow actors so generously, but what about you? How did you find the experience? 
I um, as an actor. You yeah, know, yeah. It was a funny one because I sort of I had so many responsibilities as, as a producer, but it was an in-house agreement that a month before the ship took off, I had to put down the um, production tools and go into Wesley because you've now seen it. Yeah, Wesley, it's it, it's a dark um, psychology in him. Um, very, very victim-based, which actually doesn't resonate with my personality type very much. But um, well, that would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, g- great, um, great exploration. I mean, you, you World Wide Web, you can go there and find anything, and you start to go into the psychology mm. f- for step one of, of the cutter, mm. what self-infliction of harm does, mm. and where that spawns from, and then you've got to sort of relate to a person's inability to know that they've done something wrong, but they cannot bring themselves to the discipline of implementing steps to solve. It and, and repair it, yeah. and that's. Um, I would only imagine my, the best version of myself that I would never be in that situation. How can you say it? But <laughs> yeah. that was Wesley's reality. So yeah. you have to shift your own blocks to find that, and, and you know absorb those levels of guilt and everything that made his universe dysfunctional the way it was. In 1929, one of the darkest chapters in Australian industrial history was written in blood and bitterness on the northern coalfields of New South Wales. Murderers, they were murderers. There was a consciousness that something was in the air that hadn't been before. We were isolated from the rest of the country. December the 16th, 1929 was a day that would change a nation. On that day, More than 6,000 miners, hungry, militant and desperate, closed ranks and marched to the padlock gates of the Hunter Valley coal mine, known as Rothbury. Exploding in brutal violence, this day would remain etched in their lives and their industry forevermore. What began as an undeclared war on industrial labour ended up overpowering a government, crippling an industry and besieging a community. Australian lockout. Um, it's a you know significant part of Australian history, and while we're very aware of um, our battlefields in um, world military campaigns, we're not really that aware of the battlefields that have been here in Australia itself in the 20th century. The very few people outside of the coal fields actually knew what the real story was. And it was like an onion, it was peeling back the layers. And that was very important, because lots of myths had been created around us, and yeah. we were determined to get to the kernel of what it was. And, and what motivated people to stay at committed to for 15 months to fight for a basically a principle. Yeah. And you talked Jason into directing We it. did. Yeah. We did, yeah. thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I think at the heart, I mean, the amazing thing with this as a documentary is it, is it had such a fantastic basis, a good story, an untold story, as with any good film. And um, to think that, that this was a story of historical significance, not only from an industrial level, but also a political level and, and very much a community level. Um, yeah, it was just a story begging to be told and hadn't been taught in schools yet. But you must have felt some trepidation at how to visualise it, <laughs> considering Absolutely. the history. Yeah, look, we, we had very limited resources in respect to, um, to vision, archive vision, obviously. Um, there's only a handful of stills that, that were actually available off the scene, so we recreated a lot of vision over a, a very short shoot schedule. Um, but that was our challenge, and we had to find some unique and interesting visuals to, to tell a story. Bitter and Twisted yes. is not... He is. Yes. I am. <laughs> uh, there's a good story there. Tell us quickly about the film. Um, well, it's it's sort of an indie drama about four people rediscovering their identity three years after someone died. So, yeah, it's and it's kind of there's a personal element in here, isn't there? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a film that was kind of made for for nothing, uh, sort of like one of those things where a whole bunch of people just sort of came together. The crew of 20 people, we shot it in like 20 days, all kind of under 30. It was mm. just a 
a film kind of a, a reaction of mine after my mum died. I wanted to yeah. sort of make something really positive out of a negative experience. So that was kind of where the story came from. It's just been over at Tribeca and done really well, and uh, we're having the screening here, and I'm, I still haven't seen it. So I'll be keeping the car running outside the <laughs> cinema. But it'll be interesting to see it with a festival audience. In, Absolutely. In, in, this, in this festival. And nerve wracking too, particularly when you're in it and yes. haven't seen it yet. You're just going, I hope I'm not crap, you know, like. <laughs> so anyway, but um, so yeah, no, that'll be fun. I play a character called Matt. <laughs> it's a stretch. Right, stretch. Um, no, I play. A, I play. Uh, Chris is in the film as well, mm -hmm. and um, I play Chris's friends, and right. uh, we have, you know, a close but strange relationship. And this is a film I'm incredibly proud of. I'm, uh, I love this movie, and I think it does announce Chris as a very important cinematic voice. Well, the film was made in 2005, and I never thought it would see the light of day. Um, it was a, one of those little gems that actors get every now and again, written, written and directed by uh, a very young person who's about three, um, <laughs> called Chris Weeks, and it's, it's an astonishing script for such a young man. It's about a family in the suburbs of Sydney whose uh, older, oldest brother and child dies inexplicably and suddenly one day and we pick the family up three years later. Uh, oh, I just realised the synchronicity of the film being picked up three years later, how bizarre. Um, and the family has just been caught in their grief and has not processed it, has not grown, in fact has kind of imploded and, and we catch them at a moment of transition in their lives and you get a sense that they have moved on. Hey. You want to go for a walk? How is Jordan? Oh, don't ask. The kids? Oh, they're okay. No, it's bullshit actually, I'm lying. <laughs> I mean, what is the problem? I don't know. Wake up! Can we go out for dinner tonight? Maybe next weekend. What are we watching? That's my neighbour. Never really wanted anything before. Leave me alone! No! When did he leave? I just wanted it all back. I hated it, but I was happier before. Seems Since Liam died, we've all become so closed. And everything stopped, but time didn't. I'm pregnant. Still think you love me? Yes. Love. Time. It's all the same thing. It's about knowing what you want and taking it. Jordan, this isn't going to go away. We can't keep tippy-toeing around this. Everybody feels like shit sometimes. It's not an excuse. Three years. It's enough. keep on tippy-toeing around it. Please. This is my life. It's my life. You know, we just want to get involved in stuff and, yeah good thing. Say that again? I said it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We, we came at this concept thinking what do we want yeah. as a filmmaker, as a producer, as a director, as writers, what do we want when we go to a festival? One, we want it to be non-competitive. We don't want it to be a rival situation. We want everyone to get together, feel like they're part of a community. Two, get out of the city, get to a beautiful picturesque location, spend time with people that for four days, get stuck, mobile doesn't work, doesn't matter, hang out with people, you know, yeah. talk, be honest. Yeah. You know, you're in a big city, Sydney, always the yeah. phone rings yeah. at an appointment. Here, everyone's trapped. It's like, <laughs> Your like, phone still rings. Yeah. <laughs> Mine does. Phone still rings. But it's like being marooned on a desert island yeah. with all these yeah. filmmakers. Yeah. It's fun. But the other exciting element is that it's the audiences that are coming to this festival. It is the actual end users. It's the people that go to the mainstream cinemas, that buy the tickets, that choose which films they go to. So having that connection between the audiences and the filmmakers is what makes this a really special yeah, because festival. Because people can have direct contact with people. Yes. Here. 
Yes, yeah, so we've real. heard that from audiences. Yeah. 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 You know, that say, you know, oh, oh, it was great that I could actually yeah. talk to the filmmaker. Yeah. Or they're saying, I didn't understand that part, or that didn't work for me. Yeah. And that's important, creating a dialogue, yeah. understanding what audiences want yes. from Australian films. These are, these are not Buffy audience, film Buffy audience. No, they're no. a real audience. Yeah. 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 And that's yeah. because it's set in a rural location, yeah. in a country yeah. town, you know. And the New South Wales mining that have come on board as our presenting sponsor, I mean, they are... I mean, they're a dream sponsor. They're, so, they're actually on the ground with us, answering the phones, yes. putting tickets. They put staff here? Staff here. Yes. So it's not just writing a check no. and putting all, all the sponsors yeah. have I mean, really contributed. Yeah, yeah. Brother got, came, yeah. came and helped us plant trees. Yeah, they, <laughs> they did. The whole brother, like yeah. 20 staff came up yeah. on the train, planted a thousand, part of yeah. a thousand tree we have We have um, Borrow, Country Link yeah. who are Country helping us, us a train. Tra yeah. and transport, <laughs> you know, crew Hyundai, service. Hyundai supplies all the cars. Yeah, so I think you're the only festival with its own train. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I don't know if you know. I mean, have you done a count of how many films? Are we the largest in the world? I would like to know. It no. is, I, I, as far as I'm, can, as, as far as I know, We've it done. is the largest single showcase of Australian films. Uh, in the if world. you count everything, yeah. Yeah. because it's purely Australian. That's yes. right. No, yeah. and we, I think that's true. I think we can say that with a hundred percent certainty. Which is wonderful. I mean, yeah. it's great to be, you know. Just but, you know, another great thing that we're doing is restoring the cinema, which yes. is, you know, so many cinemas in country towns are going, are basically yes. going. Yeah. They're turned into multi-purpose yeah. halls. Yes. They're falling down. And this cinema is actually we've we've actually built a screen with the help of our sponsor Borrell, we've restored the yes. stage, yeah. built a screen back in its original position and doubled the cinema capacity. And can you tell us what you just did and the significance of it? That was a 6,000 foot real changeover. To the other. But the significance of it for everybody here, of course, is historic. Yeah, that's the last changeover for the, uh, the old theatre. And 27 years I've been changing over. And this will be the, this was the last time you did it because these are being decommissioned and replaced by new ones. I do. Yeah. And it's also the last your last official act as a projectionist. It is. So that was, what was, it's sad. What, it's sad, but it's also a lot of wonderful memories, I suppose. Oh, definitely. definitely. The, the amount of stuff that's going on, the seminars that they've got organised, you know, it's, it's very obviously still in its beginning stages, the festival, there's no denying that, but it, it's cool nonetheless. We've got 20 um, Dungog High School students and they're learning how to edit their little own video of um, tree planting, which was shot in Dungog. I think this is a great initiative. I think it's a great way of bringing Australian films and documentary and short films to the public of Australia. I think uh, Alana, what she's brought together here is, a, is an interesting group of filmmakers. It's a great collection of Australian uh, content and, uh, and I think this should be really heavily supported. So I'm, I'm here as the Film Finance Corporation, even though not, we're not a sponsor, we're here to observe and see what's happening and hopefully the new agency Screen Australia will become a strong sponsor of this because it's a really good event. So uh, Paul, I, I understand you live next door to the cinema. That's right, my room is next door, yep. What's that like? Is that good during the festival? <laughs> it doesn't worry me. Yeah? No, not worry me at all. Um, I live right next door to the station, it doesn't worry me either. Yeah. Uh, I get up at, what, 20 to 5 every morning to go to work. Yeah. Oh, there's always a train in there, I didn't hear it come in. <laughs> so, uh, this is this is good for the yeah. town. Yeah. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of people go past, a lot of people talking and, and all that. That was good. This event is like like a true sharing of the commonwealth of this country. I mean, uh, firstly, the films have come to this town in the country, and they're all Australian films, and it's given the residents and people of this district a great opportunity to catch up on brand new Australian material, which they're very unlikely to see because of the immense difficulty there is in getting exhibition of Australian product in Australia. The other thing is that this has been really well sponsored by um, New South Wales Mining, um, Brother, Hyundai, um, 
Windham and Wines, uh, really, really good support from all those countries, which is them sharing their wealth that they've made out of Australia, particularly the mining companies with their, you know, exploitation of our mineral assets and the coal and everything else, and that is being shared back to the community and the arts. Now that's a really, really good thing to happen. It's what, there should be a lot, lot more of that going on.